December 22nd, 1916. Dear Cousin Sadie, just a few lines to let you know that I am still alive and able to drag one leg after the other. I received your letter some time ago and was glad to hear from you. Well, Sadie, we have moved away from the mudfields and we are in a good place now. We are all stopping in houses now. It is a lot better than building your own house like we had to do all summer. And there were some houses just enough to keep the rain off and that is all. Well, I guess that I won't hardly know Sussex when I get back, if I ever do. For I guess there has been a big change there since I left and a lot of new buildings went up. There must be lots of work there for the people that has left. And there's been a lot who have come away from there. And a lot who won't go back, poor fellows. Well, Sadie, I have not got your box yet. I got one from Aunt Casey the other day. There was a nice fruitcake in it, and it was all mashed up so you could hardly tell what it was. A shame that stuff gets mashed up as bad as it does coming over here. Well, Sadie, I forgot to ask you where Charlie was. Did he get over here with the first contingent? I've never heard anything about him. I had a letter from Bessie, and one from Mother the other day. She was saying that Johnny had come back from the West and that he likes it fine out there. He says if he's going out another fall, if nothing happens. I hope that I can be home before next fall. I will take a trip out there with him. News is scarce, so I will have to close, hoping to hear from you soon. From your loving cousin, Wesley. August 12th, 1916. Dear Mother, On the night of May 31st, we left camp and took the trail up to Yeeps, then marched to the reserve dugout, arriving somewhere about midnight. The next day I had to take a sick man up to Maple Copes to see the MD just behind the firing line. There were a good many shells coming from across the line, and some came a great deal closer than I liked, but I got clear all right. That night, I did not have to go up with the working party as I was on other duty. On the morning of June 2nd, at 8 o'clock, we were startled by the bombardment that opened up. We stood outside the dugout and listened to the steady roll of artillery and at times crawled up to the edge of the bank to watch the smoke that rose from the bursting shells. Then about 10 o'clock, we got orders to stand in fighting order, ready to move off at a moment's notice, and about the same time the wounded from the front line and supports began to arrive, well, hundreds, and among them Princey. He had come down with the scout sergeant, not wounded but badly shaken up. I was very glad they would not allow him to go up again. We got an idea from those fellows just how bad things were up the line, and how far over the Germans had come. At noon we got orders to fall in and advance. We had about a mile and a half to go under heavy shell fire, and of course some of us were never to reach our destination. Before we had gone very far, I saw Joe. He had been put out of action and was on the way to the dressing station. After we got up to where the communication trench crossed the road, it was no longer possible to stay with it. We had to take to the open fields, crawl through old ditches full of mud and water before arriving at Maple Copse about 8 p.m. Some of us advanced further than we were expected to and brought up in a trench full of Germans, but they were all dead or so near that it amounted to the same thing. A great chance for souvenirs, for they were in full marching order. Thought they were going to walk over and stay, I guess. Well, we finally formed a line along the edge of the copse and began to dig in with the entrenching tools. By this time, it was beginning to get dark, for the place was thick with smoke from the bursting shells. I got a place where I had pretty good cover, and soon Sergeant Smith joined me. We had a little bite to eat, and perhaps we were not hungry. Just at dark, the bombardment took on double force. They also opened up on us with machine guns and rifle fire. Star shells were sent up by the hundreds. We watched all we could and worked the old Ross in the bargain. When I left Smith, I did not expect to see him again, for it did not seem possible that a man could go ten yards through that hellfire and live. However, we made it all right, but it was a rough old trip. My next job was to go out with reinforcements to take another part of the line. And then, while digging a hole to crawl into, I got hit by a piece of shrapnel. Later, another fellow, who had been wounded, and I got hold of a tube of iodine and painted each other up. Soon, dawn came, and as we were rather cold and hungry, along with lots of other things, some of the boys went scouting and got in touch with bully beef and biscuits, 
also a jug of beer, and we had breakfast. In the course of the morning, I got handled pretty roughly by a couple of shells. When noon came, I saw about 20 of our airplanes going over to see the Kaiser. Then I picked up what was left of my old rifle and started for the dressing station. Before I went, I found that Sergeant Smith had been killed. Also, many more of my pals. Roland Barnes was very much alive. Poor old Maple Copes looked as if it had been torn upside down, trees and all. When I got down to the dressing station, I met Prince again. He was very glad to see me. Soon I moved on again, and have been moving on ever since. Suppose I will until I get attached to a regiment again. I have not written any other letters to Canada, for I don't seem to feel like writing, and then it is impossible to send a permanent address at present. Hope you are all well. Lots of love to all. Your affectionate son, Jack Hoyt. Hampton, December 25th, 1916. Dear Mrs. Nutter, received your letter. I am glad to know you take an interest in my son. We have never heard anything more of him since we heard of him being missing. He may be a prisoner in Germany, but if so, he would have written to me, unless he was not allowed. It was seldom he missed a week writing to me. He wrote me about your son when he was killed said he lost his best friend and sent me his picture and told me to keep it for him. I have another son in France and my heart is aching for them both. One I expect I have lost and the other I don't know what minute I may hear of something happening to him. His name is Wilfred, so if you ever see that name in the papers, you will know he is mine. You spoke of Mrs. William Flewelling's son where does she live? My husband was wondering if he knowed them. What company did her son go in? Was he with your son? If I ever hear from my son, I will certainly let you know. I hope to hear something of Edgar, yet if he is not killed. I don't see why they couldn't find his body unless he is buried among some of those shell holes. But as yet they cannot tell. I only hope for his return and the return of the other one. Mrs. Fred Prince, Hampton. To Mrs. William Chown of Berwick, New Brunswick. Dear Madame, kindly excuse me taking the liberty of writing, but I feel I must send you a few lines to thank you for your kindness in sending a Christmas stocking, which I was fortunate enough to receive. What a splendid assortment. I am in the hospital with trench fever and pleased to say I am making good progress towards recovery. Pleased to say we have had an excellent Christmas and at the time it was hard to realise one is on active service. I assure you a little pleasure like this and we soon forget our hardships. But at the same time I am a married man with a dear wife and two darling children in England. You can bet that I am hoping to spend next Christmas with them. Yours ever grateful, Corporal W.T. Calent, 5th London Field Ambulance, Royal Army Medical Corps, France, December 1916. From Corporal H.R. Stockton, East Africa Pioneers Section, La Ronde Gay Road, Mombasa, March 7th, 1916, to E.E. E. Stockton, Auditor General's Office, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Dear brother, I have not heard from you for over a year. I hope you are well, as this leaves me at present. I am at present in charge of a pioneer section at La Ronde, Gay Road. This part is not so bad as, as I have had, and now and again I can have a, a swim in the sea. I haven't had a sick day since last April. I have been roughing it a good deal of the time, it seems to agree with me. I have had some narrow shaves but have come so far without a scratch. I expect we will, we will be at it here all this year, and the impression is that it will be on for a long time in France. I expect you can notice its effects in Canada. This is a fine country for game. You can get most anything here. Lion, leopard, buffalo, rhinoceros hippopotamus, buck of various species, zebra, ostriches, elephant, 
and snakes of all kinds. If these names are not spelled right, you'll have to guess what they are. I shot a python, ten and a half feet long. I also shot a snake, something like a cobra, nine feet long. I helped to shoot a hippopotamus some time ago. We skinned it complete and cut off the four feet, and also got some small tusks and plenty of cabacas. I cannot say anything about military matters. As a soldier, I cannot say very much. When it is over, I will write you a long letter and tell you what we have been doing. We are right under the equator here and have to wear double hats or a helmet. The Germans in German East are mostly all native soldiers. We also have some native soldiers. They're fine soldiers. We have a lot of Indians, but the least said about Indians, the better. General Smuts from South Africa, Pretoria, has arrived here with a very nice army. He is chief in command for German East. We have been defending the British East ever since the war started, as we weren't strong enough to do anything else. General Smuts will no doubt start things in earnest very shortly. We have got to drive the Germans out of British East for a start, and taking German East is a big contract. It covers such a distance on the map, and the Germans are pretty strong. This is their chief colony, and you can bet they mean to fight to keep it before giving it up. We will no doubt get it in time, but we will not have any walkover. I see in your last letter you want to know what I'm going to do after the war. Well, to tell you the truth, by the time the war is over, I will be so much of a soldier that whether I will be any good for anything else, I don't know. However, it is not over yet. I shall be pleased when it is. Remember me to the Davidsons and others. From your brother, Hubert. Address all letters to care of OCEA Pioneers, Head Office, Nairobi. France, September 16th, 1918. Dear Sadie, woken up to a gorgeous day and nothing much doing. So I'll spend a few minutes in conversation with you. My mail has been quite regular lately and I've received all your letters written up to a month ago. Your conception of engineers was close to the nature of work we had some months ago. But since warfare has been so much in vogue, that has altogether changed. Sometimes we're in front of the infantry, sometimes with them, but most of all slightly in the rear, which believe me is the worst place of all. But I've always managed so far to come out of some mighty tight places with only a few scratches and lots of torn clothes. I've had some mighty good experiences building bridges and etc. under some heavy shell fire. By the way, I met Sandy Thorne last week, going in the line as I was coming out, and had a long chat with him. It was pretty hard to tell who was dirtier, he or I. So Billy Pat was wounded. Must have been his first time in, for he was at the base when we were down south. All I can say, he's damn lucky. I suppose you heard poor Bev's fate. One consolation is that he had never been worn out and fatigued by the long period of that real stuff. Went to the rear area yesterday and had a dandy bath and changed clothes and I feel like a brand new fiddlestick. The moon was simply glorious last night and stayed out to drink in the beauty of it until Fritz began showering us with bombs when I had to scurry off into my little hole in the ground. I witnessed yesterday at least 20 good scraps in the air. I guess your heavy thunderstorms must have been some relation to the ones we had last week. I will tell you what is uppermost in my mind at the present time, that is how much I would like to be taking the trip of this letter and arriving home to see you all. Have a few cruises along the woods and along the shores with my gun on my shoulder. Tell the boys I'm always thinking of them and hope to see them again sometime. Oceans of love to father and mother and keep a little for yourself. Love less.